You are now listening to MedEd Talks Primary Care, a Vindico Medical Education production. To view CE information and claim credit, log into MedEdTalks.com and search Familial Chylomicronemia Syndrome, a multi-specialty guide to early recognition and novel therapies, or click the link in the notes section of this podcast. Now, here's your host, Dr. Bajaj. Hi, I'm Dr. Archon Bajaj, a lipid specialist and assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania. I am also the director of clinical trials at the Penn Preventive Cardiology Program. This is the first of a three-episode series titled Familial Chylomicronemia Syndrome, a multi-specialty guide to early recognition and novel therapies. For this episode, I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Zahid Ahmad, Associate Professor in the Division of Endocrinology at the UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. Thank you for joining me today, Zahid. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So today we'll be discussing the mechanisms of FCS and the overall burden of this disease on patients. Sahid, to start us off, can you give the listeners a background on FCS and place it in context of high triglyceride disorders? Yeah, uh, maybe we could start with what is high triglycerides. I mean, so that there are different definitions based upon what you read. We recently wrote an expert opinion about FCS, and there we we define severe hypertriglyceridemia as above 1,000, 1,000 milligrams per deciliter. we're very U.S. based, so we're using you know milligrams per deciliter. In the rest of the world, they would say it's 10 millimoles per liter, which is equivalent to 880 milligrams per deciliter. So somewhere around that range is where individuals with FCS uh, get their triglycerides. But much above that range, usually they have high triglycerides. There are other things that cause that too. You know, we I often refer to uh, the polygenic hypertriglyceridemia. I, I like to call it multifactorial chylomicronemia syndrome. Uh, but that's an important one to distinguish between FCS. Uh, but yeah, that, that's where we start. And then what is FCS? So FCS is a condition where you cannot clear triglycerides out of their circulation. And the main issue is defects with the lipoprotein lipase enzyme. So that's the main enzyme that clears out triglycerides. And most individuals with FCS have a defect in the lipoprotein lipase enzyme, an inherited genetic defect that's autosomally recessively inherited. And uh, because of that, they are unable to clear triglycerides. There are other genes too that can that get uh, mutations that can cause FCS. Almost all of those have to do with cofactors or other things that activate lipoprotein lipase. And so uh, that's basically what it is. These individuals, unfortunately, cannot clear triglycerides. The triglycerides stay in their blood. And the main consequence of that is pancreatitis. And can you maybe tell us a little bit more about, you know, when triglyceride levels are in that thousand and higher range, the difference uh, with chylomicron particles forming? What what makes what makes chylomicron particles so unique compared to our other lipoprotein particles? Yeah, well, so chylomicrons are are dietary derived. So when we eat, we package the triglycerides into chylomicrons that eventually make their way into your circulation. Most people would clear out their, their chylomicrons within a few hours and they don't really cause any problem. But individuals who have defects in lipoprotein lipase, uh, like FCS, or some secondary issue where they, their lipoprotein lipase is totally saturated and can't function anymore, uh, they uh, start accumulating chylomicrons. You know, you can get up to triglyceride levels of 1,000 before you really get a lot of chylomicrons, but, uh, but once you get them, you have these giant particles, giant compared to other lipoproteins, uh, giant particles that are carrying a ton of triglycerides and are very hard to get out of the blood. And just to clarify for everyone, because of the size of these particles, cardiovascular disease is not a concern, correct? Right. We wrote about that in our in our statement uh, that these particles are not what really cause cardiovascular disease. That's more particles that have cholesterol in them. But you should not ignore cardiovascular risk factors in people with high triglycerides, uh, especially, you know, FCS, yes, they typically don't get cardiovascular disease, but the other causes of high triglycerides, they often can get cardiovascular disease because they have risk factors like diabetes or hypertension, or obesity. And so it is important to think about cardiovascular disease, but uh, it's very clear that you can have triglycerides of 10,000, 20,000, and you're not going to have a heart attack because of that. Really, the main concern is that acute pancreatitis. Right, right. The pancreatitis is a pretty serious thing. I mean, luckily, we're pretty good at managing it nowadays, but it does have a morbidity 
burden and, and mortality burden. And we'll, we'll talk a, a bit more about that burden that it, it places on patients. But maybe while we're walking through this pathway of, of LPL and its central role in triglyceride metabolism and, and the defects in LPL that lead to FCS, can you uh, comment on the role of APOC3 in this pathway? Just because it's going to be important to understand this, to understand the new therapies that target APOC3 in development. Yeah, so APOC3 is a pretty fascinating protein that uh, is carried on lipoproteins like chylomicrons and VLDL, and also has some, there's some free APOC3 in the blood. Its normal function is to inhibit the activity of lipoprotein lipase. So it slows it down most of the time. And this is important because uh, if you develop drugs that stop like APOC3 from doing what they're doing or reduce the levels of APOC3, maybe that would reduce triglycerides. Maybe that would allow lipoprotein lipase to be more active and reduce triglycerides. Um, and, and also APOC3 seems to be a cofactor for other lipases. So I mentioned lipoprotein lipase, but we do have others, hepatic lipase and hormone sensitive lipase, so, several other lipases that exist in the circulation in different organs and different places that can do some of the job of lipoprotein lipase, but they're not quite as good at it. So people who are paying attention might be wondering, you mentioned that FCS is caused by defects in the LPL pathway. So almost a non-functional LPL activity. And we're talking about APOC3, which inhibits LPL. But if you lack that LPL activity, do you, can you comment on how inhibiting APOC3 would still potentially work in FCS patients? Yeah, you know, uh, that's a good point because it was actually kind of a surprise that inhibiting APOC3 worked for FCS patients. And the first paper published was in the New England Journal out of Canada where they gave an APOC3 inhibitor, an investigational agent, to three individuals with FCS and it lowered their triglycerides. And, and that was a kind of an unexpected uh, unexpected finding. Whoever decided to try that was, a you know, we, we need to shake their hand and tell them, thank you so much for doing that. And probably the reason why it works is because there are other lipases, like I mentioned. So these other lipases may be more active when you inhibit APOC3. And there's some data to suggest that. It's not very easy to study, but they do work. And in the end, for the individual person who has FCS, what they care about is reducing triglycerides and preventing pancreatitis. So let's go through a little bit about, we keep bringing up this, this threat of acute pancreatitis in, in these patients. And maybe you can tell us a little bit, you know, from the patient perspective, what, what does having FCS mean for their life? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a huge burden. Um, I keep referencing the expert opinion paper that we wrote for the National Liquid Association. If you read through that, we actually included a lot of patient perspectives. Essentially, every section or almost every section of that manuscript has some blurbs from patients uh, because we wanted to make sure people understood what it meant. And when you think about pancreatitis, the, the type of things that patients said were, you know, it's a huge psychological burden to have to worry about pancreatitis, not to mention the fact that you end up going to the emergency room all the time. Sometimes doctors don't believe you. They accuse you of being alcoholics. Until APOC3 inhibitors were recently approved, we had no real treatment for, for these people other than to put them on an extremely low-fat diet, which does work you know, for many people, but who can stay on one diet forever? I mean, it's, it's almost impossible. Can you maybe comment on, you know, existing triglyceride lowering therapies and their limitations in patients with FCS? Yeah. So before the recent APOC3 inhibitor olazarsin was approved by the FDA, the main drugs we used to lower triglycerides were fibrates and omega-3. And both of those exert their action mostly in the liver. They may activate lipoprotein lipase a little bit, but it's very minor. And they certainly don't activate or seem to activate other lipases. And so you can give those medications to individuals with FCS and their triglycerides don't change much. You know, that's actually one of the key characteristics of FCS, one of the diagnostic characteristics of FCS, that they don't respond well to the drugs that we already had. The other drug that exists is niacin, which does lower triglycerides, but it also raises blood sugar. People get uh, flushing and you know, it has it is the most hepatotoxic lipid drug we have. If I if someone comes to me on on niacin, my first step is take them off of niacin, which sometimes helps. I think we we've all stopped stopped using niacin for the most part. 
I, I think you've pointed out a couple uh, sort of challenges with, with treating these patients historically and, and that it's been limited to symptom control and not really targeting the underlying disease mechanism. Yeah, exactly. So it's great to have options now. You know, I think this was a, this a huge step forward for FCS. You know, when I talk about FCS, I always show a picture of what might be the first case, which is a, a, a boy in Germany who has all these scars on his abdomen from the multiple uh, surgeries he had because this was like the 1930s and they, they had no imaging. And so every time he had pain, they essentially had to do an exploratory uh, laparotomy or something, and uh, open laparotomy. And, and the only thing they noticed was that after surgery, when he wasn't eating something, his blood would become less lipemic. And that was the 1930s. And until 2024, we had no other treatment for FCS. You know, it was a long time to go without, without a dedicated treatment for individuals with FCS. And I, I think, you know, you pointed this out already that, you know, treatment thus far, you know, focusing in on the diet, the anxiety that the patients have, and, and really thinking about their psychosocial, uh, the burden associated with FCS. Maybe you can also talk about like how care of these patients and also the, the chronic care of these patients requires a full team. It does. And actually what's really unfortunate is that it can take a while to find it. Or FCS patients on average have to see five providers before they find one who's familiar with FCS. Uh, that's some published data from several years ago. Hopefully it's getting better soon, or, or better now with things like this podcast and others where improving awareness. You want a, uh, a lipid specialist who's familiar with FCS. You want a dietitian or nutritionist who understands the diet because many dietitians and nutritionists are focused on cardiovascular health and being on heart health in your Mediterranean diets. And that's not quite what these individuals need to be on. They need to be on an extremely low-fat diet. Um, it also helps to have a you know, gastroenterologist or even better, a pancreatologist involved in their care so that uh, you know, somebody knows their condition, somebody can explain things to them about pancreatitis and how to prevent it and how to manage it and stuff like that. It does take a team, and it also takes a while for FCS patients to find that team. It's certainly a complex condition complex underlying genetics uh, involved and, and certainly complex uh, treatment. And it does require a full team that's that's informed about uh, being able to manage FCS and, and conditions like uh, acute pancreatitis that go along with it. Well, thank you, Dr. Ahmad, for this excellent discussion. And thanks to our audience for listening. Please remember to take the post-test and complete the evaluation to receive CE credit. Also, please tune in for additional episodes within the series. In our next episode, I will be speaking with Dr. Aaron Mikos about strategies for timely diagnosis of FCS. Thanks again for listening to MedEd Talks Primary Care. CE credit can be claimed through MedEdTalks.com. For other episodes in this series, search Familial Chylomicronemia Syndrome, a multi-specialty guide to early recognition and novel therapies. <laughs>